Good afternoon. Uh, I will reiterate what uh, James Wilson MacDonald has said about uh, this meeting, which I think is absolutely uh, excellent and is turning out uh, very well indeed. So that's what we're talking about. I'm going to go through this at some speed because I've got quite a lot to talk about. So we've already established that this quadraquina syndrome is just that. It's a syndrome of different symptoms and signs. Uh, what I do want to emphasise is that by the time we get to here, it's too late. So the diagnosis needs to be made much earlier than it is being made, and I'll give you some figures to support that. Just to look at the epidemiology, you'll get a central disc prolapse in a small number of all disc prolapses and a quadraquina syndrome in less than 10% of those central disc prolapses. You, of course, uh, and everybody else is taught that this is an extremely rare condition, but in the last 10 years, Mr. Wilson McDonald and I have over 200 medical legal cases. Now, that's a huge number. So I want to classify this syndrome, and we've heard that done earlier by several speakers, but I want to be very clear about this because this is really the guts of the talk. So we have patients who have back pain or unilateral leg pain. That's a routine matter. We'll forget about that. I've called this... Ah, I've changed the slide as well. I've called this CS risk. This is what Mr Wilson McDonald was talking about, patients with bilateral radiculopathies, bilateral sciatica, bilateral numbness, bilateral weakness, bilateral loss of reflexes, or any combination of that. These patients are at risk of developing a quadraquina syndrome, but they don't have a quadraquina syndrome at that moment. We've heard about the incomplete quadraquina syndrome, where there are objective signs, but the patient is still in control of their bladder. There's voluntary control of micturition. CSR is this neurogenic retention of urine with the paralyzed insensate bladder, and once the bladder's full, reflex contraction of the bladder, you get incontinence. It's important, um, it's not so important that Mr. Wilson McDonald made any point about this, but uh, some of us think it's important to recognize that there is, in fact, a later phase. These patients do have fun some function preserved. They may have some anal tone, they may have some perianal sensation, um, and eventually, the whole thing goes and there's nothing left. So I'm not going to dwell on these. We've seen these slides. Large central disc prolapse at uh, L45, obliterating the canal. Um, this is a uh, post-op scan, same patient, disc prolapse removed, and the spinal canal is now. Well, that, that's the patient. That's the post-op. Um, this is a post-op hematoma here, here. Another cause of cord aquinas syndrome. And here is a post-operative CSF leak, a tension CSF leak, um, a tension meningus also causing compression of the quadraquina and nerves. All right. In terms of treatment, here's the principle. If you should be operating at this point in time right now and you delay the surgery, any neurological and functional losses that occur after this point in time, absent a complication of surgery, won't occur. You will stop the patient deteriorating, and you open up the possibility of function improvement, which I'm going to deal with. So the principle is quite straightforward. Oh, that was supposed to be the pointer. You treat, obviously, as early as reasonably possible. Um, there is this publication about how quickly you should deal with this condition. And these are the conclusions. In that paper, I said, though I, nobody wrote in saying this is stupid. So. Looking at our classification again, if you've got back pain and unilateral radiculopathy, you're treated routinely. <coughs> if you're in this risk group, in the paper I said you should have a scan within 24 hours. Some experts I've talked to say it's 40 hours, provided you keep the patient under careful review. I want to make a point that I think is the way forward, if we're ever going to make any difference to this condition, is that we're taught that you make this diagnosis on the basis of the history and the clinical examination. In my opinion, MR imaging is part of triage now. You can't make a clinical diagnosis, um, with, if, particularly if you're in this group. This group's a completely different, but if you're in any of these groups, you must, I think you must have a scan quickly. So there's the recommendation for this group. We've talked about this, and James uh, gave some patients. 
And you heard what I had to say. These patients have to go to theatre immediately. These patients are going to do reasonably well. Now, we'll talk about how well they're going to do a bit later on, but basically, they will not have Mr. Tophill's or Dave's urodynamic studies will not be normal in these patients. They will not be normal. Is that working? You got his finger over there. Oh yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Did you need assistance? Yes. Well, this is light, is it? <laughs> I thought it just came up there by magic. Now then, um, these patients won't necessarily have normal urodynamic studies. In fact, very few of them will. But they'll have socially normal control of their bladder and bowels in the majority of cases. They may have every McDonald's on their phone, um, as Dave said. You know, they need to know where the toilets are but they're not using catheters and pads. The paralysed bladder, I'm going to talk about in detail uh, in a moment, uh, and my views, my published views, have uh, had to change. And this group do not, is very unlikely to get any recovery, and you absolutely don't need to operate on them as an emergency, but you would operate on them, I would have thought, within a day or two. Um, so, outcomes, we've just talked about this. These patients never had a problem with the bladder and bowel, and so they never will. These patients will have normal or socially normal bladder and bowel control because, by definition, the incomplete quadriquina patient has objective signs. They have loss of perineal sensation, and because genital sensation is an important part of sex, these patients will have impaired sexual sensation and some impairment of sexual function, but they can normally uh, have a reasonably good sex life and achieve uh, orgasm. I'll talk about CSR later. These patients aren't going to do well at all. All right. What proportion of the patients with a paralysed bladder are going to get better? And should you treat it urgently or as an emergency in order to try and um, get recovery of bladder and bowel function, which has already been lost? So I keep doing that. Didn't I? So in six studies, you find that recovery function occurs in that proportion of patients. But the problem is that many of these studies include CSI patients who will get better anyway, and CSR patients who may well not. I don't believe the figure for CSR is 78% recovery. It's just, that just doesn't make sense to me. So some say that recovery of bladder and bowel function in the patient with a paralyzed bladder, yes or no, whatever their belief is, will occur regardless of when you operate. Operate as an emergency, operate tomorrow, operate in three months' time, and they're just as likely to get better. Some have said this. I have said it, although I now think that I'm probably wrong, that probably there aren't better outcomes um, with very urgent surgery in, once the bladder has become paralysed. So here we have the paper that I published about nine years ago, where I said, the timing of surgery probably does influence the outcome. And here is the, there was a problem with me having to reinterpret the data, and so that was a subsequent letter published about a year later. I'm just going to amplify that. So, these are patients with paralysed bladders, CSR patients. And there are six studies. So, we find that in the patients who the final bladder function is normal, we're operated on um, within 24 hours, but not normal, but we can see normal 41, 20, et cetera, et cetera. Beyond 48 hours, they're exactly the same. But statistically, the difference between uh, this group here, that's well, that group and that group, is statistically significant at one in uh, a thousand, better than one in a thousand. So this says, if you believe it, and I'm, I don't believe it anymore, but um, it's my paper, so <laughs> there we are. Um, but this says that if you've got a paralysed bladder, get them to the theatre straight away, and if you do that within 24 hours, you're more likely to get a better outcome than if you delay the surgery. The criticism, and Mr Wilson MacDonald has dealt with this, is that all of these reviews are based on previously published papers, uh, their review of the notes, the data is poor, the classification is often not very well defined, um, and um, we have to remember this data is written down often by a junior doctor in training at three in the morning. 
He's not interested in forensic matters. He doesn't care whether your bladder's been paralysed for 12 hours or 18 hours or 30 hours. It's just not written. It often goes, bladder gone, one day. And you can't get any data out of that. And the big criticism is that if you see benefit in an early group, less than 24 hours in the uh, paper that I published, perhaps that's because the early group has more CSI patients in it. And by 48 hours, they've deteriorated. And it's not an effect of early surgery. It's an effect of treating prior to deterioration to CSR. And that's bedeviled all of this, that the data is poor. And these are the criticisms. So here's a criticism by um, Gordon Finley. And here's a criticism by him, um, Bob McFarlane, basically making that point that if you select the data, sometimes if you select your papers, uh, you can see an apparent effect, but it's not real. So I'm going to look now. These are the first 40 medical legal uh, uh, cases that I dealt with. And we're going to deal in a minute with, it's now 140. And with James's, it'll be over 200 when we get them together. So. <coughs> This also appeared to show an effect of early surgery. So that those treated within 24 hours uh, of surgery, we can look at this as the, um, uh, the final slide. Treated early, six patients of 40 recovered bladder function, one didn't. In this group, treated within 24 to 48 hours, it was exactly reversed. And once again, you have these huge um, points of significance. But these are tiny numbers. In each cell, you've got very small numbers. And how much you can rely on that, I think, is very debatable. But just a, a, a kind of straw in the wind. So I risk um, um, treading on Mr. De Bono's ground here. Uh, but there are now two cases that have uh, where there is a judgment in this matter. So this is Oakes v. Nijnegaard. And what um, His Honour Justice Aikenhead said was this was a CSI case. The chap should have been treated before bladder paralysis. And there was an agreement that if treated before bladder paralysis, he would have done tolerably well, much better than he did. And uh, um, his lordship considered the CSR case and said, I don't have to consider this because it's not a CSR case, but if I did, I think he'd have uh, had the same outcome. So that's a so-called obiter judgment, doesn't carry a huge amount of weight. But then Mr. Lord Justice Coulson, or Mr. Justice Coulson, in fact, looked at the case of Hussein, who was treated, as a matter of fact, um, oh, sorry, forgive me, he should have been treated 12 hours after bladder paralysis. And hearing from a whole host of experts, uh, which didn't include me, they said that he said that treatment 12 hours after CSR is not going to be associated with a better outcome. So he doesn't believe, and this is, this is part of the law now, so this, this carries some precedence. So the weight of evidence, you know, notwithstanding my two papers, is that probably once your bladder's paralysed, it's too late. And what I think, this is how I see the subject now. The data is poor, and we can't prove. I think this is kind of like a Scottish not, not proven. You know, we don't really know. The data's too, the data's very poor. But what we cannot say, for, for sure, is that there will be better outcomes if you operate promptly in the paralysed, patient with a paralysed bladder. And that then legally, I think, leads us to two uh, thoughts. Firstly, there's no duty of care to operate urgently. You don't have to take these patients to theatre in the middle of the night. And even if they, somebody says, well, in this particular case, you should have taken them to theatre in the middle of the night, once the bladder's paralysed, litigants will not be able to demonstrate causation. They would have been just as bad anyway. I just throw this in. This is the first 40 medical legal case. Very little um, uh, evidence about this. 
But for those in this audience who regrettably have long-term problems in relation to cortical quinine syndrome, this will not come as much of a surprise. Uh, 28 of these 40 patients were working at the time of the cortical quinine syndrome, and the vast majority never returned to work again. And I think uh, for those who uh, have never uh, uh, suffered a cortical quinine syndrome, uh, to go back to work when you have to go and self-catheterize regularly, where you're incontinent of urine and expectantly, where you lean forward and you break wind, or in fact, open your bowels. <clears throat> this just prevents normal work. And most of the people that return to work were self-employed within their homes, where clearly life is a bit easier. Uh, I'm gonna just say, this is something else that's in print, but uh, just to say that uh, there is progression of symptoms uh, in terms of perineal central loss or impairment of anal tone. And as time passes, essentially, you move um, uh, down this curve this way. So even after CSR, there is progression of symptoms in such uh, cases. So um, here's the conclusion, and I'm going to back that up with just a few figures in a moment. You really, really want to treat this syndrome before the full-blown syndrome occurs. I think that urgent decompression after the bladder is paralyzed will help some patients, but I can't prove it. And I don't know how many it is. Uh, and that's why I say that uh, if you have a, a legal case based solely upon management after CSR, I think the claimant has a real struggle. In fact, I think they'll fail. Um, OK, I did this work over the weekend, and the statistics were done on the train coming down here this morning. So this is British Rail statistics. So if it looks a bit strange, it's probably the train was lurching at the time. Uh, the first uh, British Rail statistic is that I left the intraoperative injury page at home by mistake. So in fact, this is about 130 patients, and this is about 30 patients. So about 20% of the patients, 130 odd patients, I've got about another 15 to code, but about 20 odd percent of the patients went in without a quadriquina syndrome and were damaged during the surgery. They do universally badly. So, um, intraoperative injury, ah, well, there's a, there's a typo. That's 101. This is 101. So. What was the diagnosis at the time of treatment in this just under 100 cases? So it's 99, my fault. No patient was treated at the best time. Now, of course, these are medical legal cases. These patients are litigating, they're suing their doctors, they will have bad outcomes. You don't see your doctor if you sue your doctor if you've done well. So this is the worst end of the quadriquina spectrum. And many patients doing very well following this surgery. However, in this group who litigate, the worst end, no patient was treated at the best time. And only 16% were treated when they had the potential for their bladder to recover or not to be lost. And the majority were treated when it was too late. I have to say these slides become, for those of you who are sufferers of quadriquina, these slides, these slides become a bit more depressing as time passes. What was the diagnosis at the time of first professional contact, which was mainly with doctors? Um, there was one specialist nurse in A and D, and there was one physiotherapist. Well, 81% of them were in a treatable category, and only a fifth of them were in a category that's unlikely to do well even with prompt treatment. So in these cases, the majority were salvageable. Now, some patients go into CSR very quickly, and we have to take into account, it does take some time to examine a patient, get a scan, and organize a theater. So I looked at the timing of those patients, the 67 patients, and 10% um, developed CSR within 12 hours of being seen by the first professional contact. 
16%, it was within 24 hours, between 12 and 24 hours. And of course, the vast majority, it was over 24 hours, and sometimes it was days and weeks on end. So if we say that this group of patients, probably you can't treat them in time. And once they're CSR with a paralyzed bladder, they're not going to do well. Then we've got 23 patients who presented with a paralyzed bladder or developed it so quickly we can't treat it, which means that maybe a quarter of our patients, something of that kind, can't be treated quickly enough with the best will in the world. But if you accept that um, we ought to be able to treat patients within 12 hours of first presentation, provided we recognize what's going on, then um, unfortunately, we have that proportion of patients in whom the bad outcome was probably preventable. <coughs> so that, for these patients, and there are some of you sitting here um, today, is a complete disaster, a complete failure of the um, system. And so I'm just going to end by saying this, that when I was brought up, when I was a boy, and this probably applies to all of the doctors here, I was taught about a syndrome where the bladder was paralyzed, there was lax anal tone, uh, there was dense loss of perineus, and that was caused, called, excuse me, the quadriquina syndrome. And that's what I was taught to recognize. But of course, that is completely hopeless. That's too late. We must recognize this prior to the development of the paralyzed bladder. And if this charity wants a campaign, I think the campaign should be to educate people about CS risk and CSI, because that's where we can make a difference. <clears throat> Recognizing patients beyond that, once they've got a paralyzed bladder, I'm afraid won't do. Thank you very much.